Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this panel discussion. I hope you found the control room as moving and powerful as I have. Um, my name is Ali McCracken Gerard, and I'll be moderating a conversation today with an excellent panel of speakers. Uh, and I'd like to give them a moment to introduce uh, the two of them. We're still waiting on our third, um, and we're excited for to have a full house very soon. Um, but please introduce yourself for uh, for just a moment. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ra'id Jarrar. Uh, I am uh, an Iraqi and Palestinian American. I was born in Baghdad. Uh, I lived there uh, during the 2003 invasion. Uh, so I saw many of the uh, clips uh, that and and scenes in the in the documentary in real life while I was in Baghdad. Um, and uh, I'm, as you can see, I'm joined by my kids in the background and for. Full disclosure, Ellen and I are married, <laughs> so we're in the same house here. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Uh, Josh, please introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. I'm Josh Rushing. Um, I was the Marine officer in control room, and um, since then I, I went on and left the Marines and helped launch Al Jazeera English. And for the last, I guess I've been in Al Jazeera for 17 years. And for the last 11 or 12 years, I guess 12 years now, um, I've been the senior correspondent for Fault Lines, which is a documentary investigative style show about America, the Americas for Al Jazeera English's audience. Great. Well, thank you. Um, welcome to both of you. I'm very excited to be having this conversation today. Um, it's both fascinating and devastating how long it has been since the US invasion of Iraq feels like it was a million years ago and one second ago at the same time. Uh, and you both have extremely different perspectives that I think will add a lot to this conversation. And hopefully Jehan will be able to join us too to talk more about her experience making the film and the way that the, the film has kind of aged over time. So first I'd like to, to give Raed the floor. Um, Raed, you were in Baghdad during the US invasion in 2003. Um, could you tell us um, tell us about your experience, that anything you want to share with the audience um, related to that um, that time frame. Uh, it was, it, I was in Baghdad in the 1990s uh, and uh, again in 2003. And one thing that is not uh, very clear while watching the documentary or thinking about the Iraq war uh, is that the Iraq war started back in 1991, uh, not, not in 2003. Uh, for, uh, I would say, the majority of Iraqis who went through years of economic sanctions and bombardment, um, uh, there is a collective uh, memory that the war started in 1991. Uh, the 2003 invasion came on, on the heels of um, 12 or 13 years of intense military uh, operations and economic sanctions. Um, 2003 uh, was an extremely uh, painful experience uh, to all of us who were in Iraq. Uh, regardless of um, Iraqis' uh, political analysis of the situation, it was truly a painful experience. And at the time, um, I, th there were obviously divisions uh, within uh, our Um, divisions within our communities and our families. Um, some people thought that uh, the invasion was uh, a welcome step to get rid of uh, a dictator uh, that uh, it seemed impossible to get rid of. Uh, others uh, opposed the invasion because they thought that the Iraqi government was not bad. Um, and a few people were like myself, uh, caught in the middle of these conversations were uh, I was critical of the Iraqi uh, dictatorship at the time, but I was also opposed to uh, a foreign-led uh, invasion that would change the regime in Iraq. Uh, so it was, for me, it was, it was like there were all of these political debates. I had a blog at the time that uh, became very uh, famous around the world uh, where people were leading these kind of conversations uh, from inside Baghdad. Uh, I, want, I want to say, regardless of our political analysis, 
um, going through the, the few weeks of shock and awe uh, were horrific. It was terrifying. Um, our cities were bombarded. Our neighbors were killed. Um, the violence that we had to endure was uh, unimaginable. Uh, and I see that uh, Jihan uh, just joined us. Uh, I, I will say more about this, but I think I do want to hear uh, Jihan's opening remarks about uh, the movie first. Thank you, Rad. Uh, Jihan, welcome to welcome to the panel. My name is Ali. I'm, I'm moderating this conversation. I'm so thrilled that you've joined us. Um, we just watched the movie. Yeah. Uh, it is so powerful, it is so moving, uh, and it is so important. It is so important uh, at this snapshot in history. Um, thank you for all the work you did on the film. Um, and for this conversation, the way that I'm envisioning it is that we start by talking about 2003 and then 2004 when the movie came out and then work our way up until where we are today um, and kind of you know looking in retrospect at the last few decades of the war on terror, the US occupation of Iraq. So Jan, can you tell us when you look back at the at the movie, how did this movie break through the the media narrative about the war in Iraq? What what impact did it have in two thousand and four? What are your thoughts in retrospect about its release? Uh, and what did people think of it? How was it received at the time? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be here, and it's great to see you, Josh and Raed, and, and uh, so. Um, yeah, thank you for doing this. Um, it was a while ago, so I have to put myself back in that time. But I think what was most interesting now looking back is to remember that we didn't have YouTube at the time. We didn't have such easy access to be able to just base, you know, type in on YouTube, you know, what's happening in Iraq and basically be able to see multiple perspectives on what was going on. Um, you know, it was a pretty carefully what people saw on television screens in the United States was pretty carefully curated um, and in and people in the US were watching something that was very different from and in the West very different from what people were seeing in the Middle East um, and uh, and what was being seen on Al Jazeera and I remember as somebody who was Egyptian American having family in Egypt and family in the US how I was able to see what both sides were watching and definitely feeling like how could how could these different parts of my family even have a conversation with each other because people were seeing such radically different things um, so that's well, that's what motivated me when um, to, to, to basically go and try to be in the center of where I felt was one place news was being created, which was Qatar, um, because there was central command where you had all of the different news organizations from different parts of the world. And 10 minutes away, you had Al Jazeera, which was broadcasting um, to uh, many parts of the Arab world. Um, when the film was finished, so we, we filmed, um, it was one of the fastest films I've ever made um, because we started shooting in um, March of 2003 and we finished filming by the summer and then we edited it and it was out. Um, we finished it for Sundance of the following year. So it was about, it took less than a year um, to make. Uh, when it came out, um, it was a very, very controversial screening. I mean, I can still remember the energy in the room. You had soldiers that were still coming back from Iraq. You had um, journalists who had been there. You had you know, people were, um, you, you know, the, the, obviously emotions were very high. And actually when it first came out, you know, I remember the Village Voice wrote an article about the film saying that it was a piece of propaganda for Al Jazeera. And so actually the first article that came out was pretty bad and we thought, oh my gosh, we're gonna, you know, we were being labeled as this, you know, this piece of propaganda and, um, and people were very shocked at the images, very, very shocked because people hadn't seen, um, these images yet, and uh, and so it wasn't really until the New York Times came out and wrote a positive article about the film 
that basically all of the other journalists kind of and papers followed and and, and sort of gave gave the film a chance and then it was picked up ultimately by uh, by a film company and uh, and and shown in theaters and by that time I think people were really starting to when it started to come out 2014 people mainly in big city New York you know big cities were starting to really you know, question the war and people started coming to the theaters and the the um, the spirit of audiences in the theater were, were, was really this kind of I think watching it was kind of a bit of a protest movement, you know, going there, watching, asking questions that were being asked, um, and and having discussions that were were not being had. Um, and so that was that that was exciting, actually, as a filmmaker, to be part of that process. Um, but I don't think releasing a film like this now with YouTube in existence, I think we wouldn't have had. I think it would be a very different story because people would have already seen. The images. I mean, people in the Middle East, when I showed the film at the Cairo Film Festival, the reaction was much more like, why should we be watching this? These are images that we've seen every day. Why, why are you making us go through this again? You know, it wasn't something that felt very new or interesting, you know, or exciting. The only thing that felt very new about it was seeing Josh, actually. Um, and seeing, you know, the a US viewpoint and somebody who was going through um, this, 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 this process um, that Josh was going through. But they weren't, I would say audiences in the Arab world were not that interested um, in, 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 in seeing the film at that time. It's fascinating. Uh, YouTube certainly has changed a lot, hasn't it? Um, Josh, uh, I want to go over to you. And I, I know that um, at some point throughout this conversation, we're going to talk about where you are now, but I'd love to hear from you. Where were you then in the movie? When you watch this movie, who do you see as the mouthpiece of the empire at the time? How do you, how, what are your reflections upon that role in your life? And oh, poor Josh. <laughs> Can I just sit with the mouthpiece of the empire for a minute before we like <laughs> could go on? I mean, that, that's worthy of just. I wish I had that on my coffee <laughs> cup. <laughs> it puts me, yeah, with Darth Vader and um, a, ha a host of other characters. Um, yeah, I just want to comment on something Shahan just said, and then I'll answer your question because it's. It, it, um, you said it, the people saw, like, kind of two different worlds, because of the media that they had access to, and here we are, twenty years later. And that's so the case now, because now I, I, I we'll talk about where I am, but I, I work for Al Jazeera and I host this show, Fault Lines, and I cover uh, conspiracy theorists and the, the right a lot. I've done a number of episodes about them. And I, I look at this ecosystem of the right in America and the rest of the U.S., and it's two different worlds. And it's not that they don't have access to uh, the media back then. Maybe people didn't have the choice. Now they've made the choice to live in these two different bubbles, these two different information ecosystems um, in a way that feels like history repeating itself since you bring it up, Jahan. It's a really interesting point. For me, I, I, I don't watch the film often. I've only seen it, uh, the full film, a few times. It's really hard. Um, it's so personal. I, I don't, and I'm such a different person now than I was then. I, I like to show it to uh, students. I, I'm a lecturer with the University of Texas, and I, I always look forward each year to show it to the students because the students come in and they're 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 brash. They're, they're it's a competitive program that I teach in, and they've all won the spot to be there. And so they they've got things figured out, and they've got their positions in life kind of figured out, and they have trouble communicating to each other um, when they're they're not politically aligned, and one of the amazing things I think about control room when you see me is uh, I was a true believer. And yet um, I've come to be such a different person and see the world in such a different way. And um, so I like to use it as a lesson for students that 
I hope you don't find yourself at a point where you feel like you've got it all figured out because how sad would it be for us to not evolve? Um, the thing about my evolution is just, it's been filmed in real time and shared, um, you know, with I don't know how many people through the course of the film and then through the rest of my journey and um, with Al Jazeera. But it, it's really hard. You know, when I try to watch the film uh, when it premiered at uh, the Film Forum in New York, I was there, Jean was there, uh, went up on stage and spoke afterward. But sitting in the crowd and watching it, I made it maybe 10, 15 minutes into it. And I, I, had, to, I had to leave. And I, I spent the rest of the, the next 90 minutes talking to the popcorn guy. Um, while I waited for the, the film to finish and then I went on stage because it was just, as Jahan said, like the, you know, people were, were laughing at the things I said by that point. Um, and that, it, it hurt to see, to watch me in, in that situation. But um, I've learned, I mean, I'm so thankful for it. You know, the, the epiphany that, that I had Everyone has epiphanies in their life, I think, if they evolve. And I, and I certainly have one. There's that moment in the film where I talk about seeing their dead and our dead and then wondering why do I see them as, as them rather than us? Like, what's the difference between them and us? And what I learned years later, looking back on all of it, is we, we have these things, our, our limits of empathy or circles of empathy, and it's universal across cultures. But the basic idea is that we're most sympathetic to those we see as being most like us. And the more different we see somebody than, than us, then um, the least natural empathy we, we have for them. And what I realize now, what made me maybe a little different than the rest of the military spokespeople who were in that office is by spending so much time with producers and reporters from Al Jazeera, um, I learned that we had far more in common than we had in difference, as I learned about their family and their kids, and they learned about my family. And, and in learning that we had more in common than a difference, they became part of us rather than them. And uh, that shook my worldview in a way because the military spends a lot of effort to dehumanize adversaries um, as militaries do, and, and as militaries have to do the terrible job that they do. Um, and so I, of course, have gone, had gone through that, but in learning that we had more in common and difference, they were starting to be included in my circles of empathy. And when these Al Jazeera reporters and producers were included in my circles of empathy. That meant that the people in Iraq were as well because they looked and sounded the same. So those differences didn't seem in outer circles of empathy for me. Um, they seemed closer. And the real lesson I've taken away from that is, is every human life has equal value. The, the, and the thing is that shaped everything I've done since with all the reporting and, and everything I've done is is that's the basic premise. It, it, it shapes my worldview. The weird part about my life is everyone who evolves has these epiphanies, but not everyone's epiphanies are caught on camera the first time you have them. Um, and, and this is the gift of Shahan, is she knows how to be at the right place at the right time. Somehow, over and over and over again through the course of her work in her films, uh, she is at these, these moments in history like startup.com where she captures something that's happening really big, but she does it in really personal ways. And she happened to be there on that day that I had kind of a life-changing thought. And, and, that, and it's guided my life ever, ever since and, and all my reporting ever since. But it's, it is difficult for me to look back because it's not a political film, it's home videos for me. I, I can see everything that isn't on camera. I can hear the other sounds in the room. And, um, and it's really, really personal. And it's also, it's like seeing me frozen in time in a way that, um, you know, the older you get, there's some kind of knowledge that you can only understand by experiencing it rather than just knowing about it. And, and the passage of time, I think, is, is a big one in that way. And to, to see yourself kind of frozen in time in, in that way, it's always, it's a strange thing. Because it, it, in so many ways, I have so little in common with that person anymore. In terms of worldview, um, I just have so little in common with, with him, and yet it's me. Um, and so that, that's strange. But I, I have to say, like, had this film not happened, had my experience with the war not gone down the, the way it would have, I would have lived a completely different life where I wouldn't have had all this growth or evolution or seen the world in this way because I was a true believer. And 
true believers are captured in bubbles. So my information ecosystem and everyone around me validated my points of view um, as limited and, and as wrong as they were. And, it, and it's hard when I watch me talk to Hassan because I'm, I can tell like I'm not listening. Everything he said was right. Everything I said was wrong. And yet somehow all I was doing was playing a game of chess where I was waiting for my chance to spin it back um, rather than actually understanding what, what he was saying. And that's tough to watch as, as well. Although I'm so profoundly thankful that it was, was captured um, because I do think it's helpful. I use that also with my students when teaching them about listening, actually listening and trying to understand the other side. That's a great example on how not to do it. Um, it, it was particularly malignant the way I did it because it looks like I'm engaged and listening. But the truth is, if you listen to my answers, they haven't picked up any of the substance of what he was trying to tell me. And he was right. Thank you, Josh. Those are very introspective and fascinating remarks. And I, I do want to come back at some point to discussing growth and evolution in the, the age of such polarization um, in our media, in our society. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that later on in the discussion. Just to circle back to Rod for a bit, I want to I want to talk more. I want to hear more from you about what it meant in Iraq to create your own media. You mentioned that you had a blog um, at one point. Um, this was before YouTube. This was before TikTok. Um, this was before uh, Instagram. Um, tell tell us about your blog and how that was your own form of media, and and if there was any other way that people in Iraq were getting out their own stories to the world um, during a time when the narrative was so tightly controlled. The media in Iraq was very very controlled. Uh, so we had uh, two TV stations. Uh, and they more or less uh, were like a comic uh, interpretation of a dictatorship media, uh, where uh, it's mostly Saddam on TV, giving speeches, uh, you know, in April during his uh, birthday month, we celebrate the birthday month from the beginning of the month and spend hours uh, watching him in a white suit uh, in his palace, you know, uh, celebrating like it's <laughs> it's the most dysfunctional like you know sledgehammer propaganda media and um, around the world uh, it was very um, like going on full full, full swing propaganda like uh, pro war um, music uh, we're gonna win this war the invaders are gonna be um, you know defeated um, Coming from a family like an like an upper middle class family that is very revolutionary and critical of the regime, we had a satellite dish on our uh, roof, and it was a crime to have a satellite dish. On the satellite dish, we could watch uh, Al Jazeera, which was amazing to me as uh, a teenager. Um, like to, to have this equipment on secret equipment on the roof. We, ha we hid it under a tent on our roof. And we could watch uh, Al Jazeera when Al Jazeera was first launched. And I could also watch uh, CNN and uh, US uh, channels, you know, uh, spent the 90s uh, watching uh, like late night with Jay Leno and uh, US comedy, uh, you know, uh, interpretations of the news and, and like the way that U.S. Americans spoke about Iraq um, in, in like the news or, or non-news terms. So like I was a little bit more exposed. I like traveled outside Iraq uh, because I had more access to, to even the country. Um, so but right before the 2002 invasion, uh, I started blogging with a friend of mine and uh, started as an inside joke. Uh, I, I was in Jordan in 2002 and my friend Salam was in Iraq. Uh, and uh, I never responded to his emails, uh, so he started a blog and called it "Where Is Ra'id? Uh, and uh, he like you know posted this silly things about what ha what's happening in his everyday life, and waited for me to read that blog. And in a few weeks, um, that became a little more political. And by the time that I actually went back to Baghdad uh, by early 2003, uh, we started having uh, people read the blog. Which is kind of scary because uh, the in internet connection in Iraq was very 
highly monitored and we were um i was blogging from jordan mostly he was both blogging in, in baghdad and one of these home internet connections that are very very slow um like a phone modem um so our blog was what we call now social media like at the time we didn't even call it a blog we called it a free website <laughs> and that blog you know like it's it's like it was this revolutionary thing and and, and I started receiving messages from U.S. Americans in late 2002, early 2003, uh, of people being like, "Hey, are you actually in Baghdad, or are you some kid in Virginia, like faking it?" And I'm like, "No, I, I swear we are in Iraq. Um, we actually ended up getting a, a free uh, upgrade from Blogger.com to upload pictures, <laughs> uh, and we started uploading pictures in Baghdad. You know, uploading a photo takes like." 20 minutes of <laughs> waiting, but then there is this picture in, from, from actual Baghdad, and people were so fascinated, they were asking questions. Uh, me and my friend Saram had uh, kind of like different analysis. Like I was, I feel like he ended up being a little bit more um, open to having a US intervention. I was getting less open to having a US intervention. So we're having this like kind of like public debate about it. Um, it was amazing. It was exactly what Jahan was saying. People wanted to see something outside of the Iraqi media. And um, at the same time, uh, the US media uh, was very, very, um, you know, uh, limited in the scope of its coverage. Uh, like for me, it, honestly, like the Iraqi media was very primitive propaganda that I laughed at. But U.S. media, whether it was um, CNN or Fox News, it was more sophisticated propaganda. That was, for me, it was very painful to hear. It was a part of the violence that Iraqis endured. Uh, and, you know, we had to hear the bombs exploding in our neighborhoods. We also had to hear this um, U.S. propaganda telling Iraqis that this is for their own good, that these bombs are going to liberate Iraqis and uh, free women and uh, help Sunnis and Shia and Kurds and, uh, look, have humanitarian protection and bring democracy to a, to a country that is backwards. And, and for me, that was a part of the violence that was inflicted upon Iraqis hearing these messages over and over. So like the same, the same way that I was trying to get alternative sources of information, uh, many people from Europe and the US were also trying to do that by reading my blog, reading other very, very few blogs that were in Iraq at the time, maybe a handful, um, and trying to watch Al Jazeera, uh, because Al Jazeera had cameras uh, that were literally in downtown Baghdad, uh, showing the bombs falling on the, uh, you know, it's referred to now as the green zone. Uh, so even when I was in Baghdad, I was watching this because it wasn't very easy for me to get in a car and go there. It was this like new era of media access, of getting coverage, of actually seeing what's happening at the at the uh, at the uh, you know other side of of, of the, um, the the airplanes that are dropping these very smart, very sophisticated bombs. One more thing I want to say is that in addition to doing this, like um, now now it's you know as Josh was saying, like so many of these things that were said at the time are laughable. You know, like the thing about democracy, the thing about precision guided weapons. You know, like we don't really care. We don't really believe these things anymore. We don't believe that they happened. We, didn't, we don't believe the intentions behind them. We don't believe the thing about weapons of mass destruction. It's literally a joke. At the time, these things were very well established. The U.S. spent, you know, hundreds of days and billions of dollars establishing these very uncontested narratives uh, about this. One of the uncontested narratives was that this was a smart war that did not kill uh, civilians, um, which was not something that I experienced. I experienced many of my uh, neighbors um, were in the neighborhood that i lived in next to the airport in baghdad uh, getting killed and injured uh, many important buildings in baghdad getting destroyed during the initial invasion and, and uh, so I, I the thing i want to say before i give the, the mic back to you ali is um i, I ended up uh, working on a couple of projects in iraq uh, to document civilian casualties um, and the, I'm an architect by training, so the, the project was to both document the uh, 
landmark buildings that were destroyed in Baghdad. Uh, many of the extremely important buildings in Baghdad were completely destroyed by the initial invasion. Uh, and also to document the civilian casualties. And so I, I, uh, I was uh, uh, involved in a campaign uh, under the name of CIVIC. Uh, it was a civilian, uh, the campaign for innocent victims in conflict. Uh, and we uh, had a, a US American counterpart. Uh, her name was uh, Marla Rizika. She actually ended up uh, getting killed in Iraq a few years after that. And the idea that that I had was we needed to document how many Iraqi civilians were killed in the first month or two of the invasion. Because number one, it's important to honor the memory of these Iraqis. Like Josh was saying, Iraqis were not treated as equal uh, counterparts to US Americans. Like when a US uh, soldier is injured or, or captured, there's a lot of coverage, but when a uh, hundred Iraqis are killed. It's like a, you know, like, uh, whatever. It's like the ba background story. So, so like that's that's where like the main issue. But for me, it was also a political um, statement to say that this war was not a smart war. This was yet another ugly war that dropped bombs that killed civilians. It's another ugly war that will open the gates of more violence in Iraq. Uh, so that campaign uh, ended up documenting thousands of Iraqis were killed and injured uh, in the first 100 days of invasion. Um, we had all of their names, all of their stories, one by one. It's a door by door campaign. And like, for me, it was extremely painful, of course, to, to work with all of these other volunteers in Iraq, to knock on doors around the country and hear the stories of children and men and women and, young and old who were uh, injured and killed, who lost their loved ones uh, in, a, in a brutal war, uh, a, a violent uh, invasion of a country. Um, and at the same time, in, like the backdrop of that of, of were all the celebrations of a newly you know, born democracy and how Iraq will become the new Japan and whatever, like other propaganda tools. So um, anyway, I just want to say, like, like the, the, watching the movie again last night took me back to those to those days. Um, I have to say that it, it really aged very well. Um, you know, like I remember watching it when it first came out, and uh, still a very amazing uh, snapshot uh, of what was going on in Iraq, like the roller coaster of emotions we're having before, during, and, and after the fall of Baghdad. The like, you know, contradictory feelings about, you know, like how did this happen? Why did it happen? What's going to happen next? The scenes of looting, Iraqis turning against each other and fighting, like just like all of these like really painful moments were really captured in, in raw footage. So, yeah, thank you again to to Johan and, and, and thank you to Josh for also like showing us that um, inside scope or, or inside scoop of what was going on in, in the U.S. military. It wasn't just someone standing on the podium; it was like a part of these longer conversations, and you can see the like there is like a tiny journey there, you know, like. I can, and I know Josh like now, and I've been on the show a few times, and I can see how that trajectory ended up in this Josh. <laughs> like it's a very short trajectory, but it's very like lead. I can I can see where it's going, you know, <laughs> very clearly. Like he's asking questions there, and I'm like, I see where you're going. I see where you are in ten years from there. <laughs> Well, thank you, Raed. And Josh, I do want to talk about your trajectory, but first, I just want to ask Jihan. Jihan, can you give us an analysis of how you feel like the media has shaped um, sh shaped the world's perception uh, when it comes to the U.S.'s war on Iraq, the war on terror in general? Um, since you made the film, how do you feel like Al Jazeera has played a role uh, over the last 18 to 20 years? Um, can you know, I'd love to hear what you think. Is this something you've stayed on top of, um, something that is still of interest to you? Are you going to make a sequel to the film? I think, I mean, it, that's that's a huge question. Um, I am I still there? Am I have I disappeared? But I, I, okay, there we go. Um, the 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 yeah the internet. I'm in Cairo, so you know um, it's uh, I'm not in the best internet. Um, but um, uh, first of all, I just want to say, Josh, 
the, the reason why you were fascinating to follow as a character, uh, you know, and, and I call you a character because, you know, you shoot hundreds of hours of footage and you end up, you know, taking a small piece of that. And so, you know, in the end, you don't get to show as much of the um, nuance that actually does exist. But the reason why Josh was interesting to follow is because actually he wasn't like, all, you know, he, he was a bit different, I, I felt, because he was w talking with all of the Arab journalists all of the time and having dinner with them. And you could see that he also Cairo internet for the one. <laughs> I think we lost Jahan. No one wanted to hear the end of that sentence more than me. <laughs> <laughs> the cliffhanger. <laughs> While we're waiting for Shahan, can I? I guess yeah, please do. If she comes back, then uh, that's terrific. I happily give up the floor. It is painful to me, Rod, to hear you say that, like saying things like liberating Iraq was a kind of violence, and I think you're completely right. Um, but it, it's hurtful that I committed that kind of violence. Um, and I feel like I've lived the last uh, 18 years in penance in a way, like getting out of the Marines and helping launch Al Jazeera and the kind of coverage we've, I've done on Al Jazeera. I went back to Iraq a dozen times um, or more and Afghanistan a dozen times as well. I did a whole show on war how terrible it is. It was six episodes called On War. Um, I've lived my life in penance in a way since then. And it's like I want to say I'm sorry, but it just, what does that do? Um, and there are so many times when I went back to Iraq and I saw what that war did. And it, I always felt a personal responsibility. And I know that I'm one of like one tiny, 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 little tiny grain of sand in the huge machine, but I hate that I was. Um, and yet I was a true believer. Like when I said those things, as crazy as they were, I believed them. I, I really did. Um, and I see today, I, I kind of alluded to this, like when I cover QAnoners and the, the, the right, the far right in America, it's like, how do you explain water to fish? It's, it's, it's all around them and they don't see it. That was me then. Like it was, it was all around me, and I, I couldn't see it at, at, at all. Um, and now, you know, it's it's saved my life in so so many ways. But I am sorry. Thank you, Josh. I mean, this this means the world to, to me and to many people. I think who who hear this and like honestly, I have worked with um, Iraq veterans. Uh, who are against the war now. Uh, I've gone to almost hundreds of um, speaking events with Iraq war veterans who came back from Iraq uh, and uh, realized that that wasn't something that they signed up for uh, or had second thoughts after the fact. And like, I've, I always tell them this, like, I, I mean, I understand, like, I, on, on the one hand, like I understand that there is like a personal responsibility, but I also understand that looking at the bigger picture, um, it is really a question of who put the 18 and 19 and 20 year olds um, in inside a Humvee and then another 18 and 19 and 20 year old outside of a Humvee in Baghdad to shoot at each other. Uh, and like many, many of them like did not did not go there with like a like an agenda to like kill the Iraqis and you know, the, the vast majority of veterans who I have spoken with and went on speaking events with uh, went there because they actually believed that there was something good that's going to happen. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your words and I appreciate all of your work. Uh, and uh, there's a reason we send uh, children. One more. thing I want to say is, is that like it's much and this is something that I've, I've said like over the years, it's much easier for someone like myself, who was, uh, you know, an architect living in Baghdad at the receiving ends of bombs to oppose war and to speak up publicly about it, uh, than someone who 
joined the military uh, to actually have that epiphany and come out and say, listen, I, I was a part of this machine and I made a mistake. And this is what I, how I'm going to fix it. So I, I do appreciate that moral clarity. And I, I wanted to like point out that, that it's a much more, uh, much heavier um, emotional, intellectual lift to, to be at that place. Um, and, and to, to have that moment of, of clarity to say, I am going to um, uh, to be introspective about things that happened in the past and uh, try to fix them. And like, like honestly, like and, and this is like a good lesson for all of us. Not ju- it's not just about Iraq War. It's not about just veterans. Like we all make, make mistakes, uh, but it's about like, that that process of of coming to that realization and then translating it. Um, into action. And I want to say something about that. And I know Josh wanted to, to, to comment. Um, during my, like when, when I first came to the US, I worked with a, a Quaker organization, uh, the American Friends Service Committee. And I, I traveled around the country. I went to more than 30 states uh, on speaking tours, mostly with, um, with US veterans. And it was also an amazing experience for me, Josh, because uh, like I am, I did have a different upbringing than most Iraqis and Palestinians. Um, but deep inside, um, I also had um, negative feelings against uh, veterans who helped invade and destroy Iraq in 2003 and before. And it was it was hard for me in the beginning to meet with a veteran and um, be friends with a veteran. It was, and now it's actually not easy for me to even like look back at those days and, and see how it, I had like that moral um, like uh, you know like an, an inside conflict because on, on, on the one on the one on the one hand I, 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 I like I understood like on a uh, intellectual level that you know we're all humans we all whatever like we're put in, in different uh, bad situations. On the other hand, like I, I still had that negative feelings inside me uh, to, to deal with with like a, an Iraq war veteran or or like, so it, like it took me a while to actually stomach that and go past the the title, um, and and think like, it, like I think like I had like a couple of, of moments that that helped me go there, and I want to share one of them. It was a, like a painful moment um, because uh, one of the trips uh, I was in Chicago and I was standing out on this large uh, park. Uh, we had an exhibit of U.S. soldier boots um, representing U.S. soldiers who died in uh, the Iraq War uh, and uh, Iraqi civilian shoots representing Iraqis who died there. So it's like this big exhibit in a park. And uh, Having a conversation with with like a few of the other speakers, including a couple of vets, and then we see uh, a family uh, that approaches the park, and, um, and they they start reading the names of their U.S. vets, and they're like on, moving on their knees and, and crying, searching for the name of what appears to be a loved one. Um, I could tell that one of their family members was killed in Iraq, and they wanted to find. The, the shoes that represented that family member, and it it was particularly um, painful to me because just a few months before that, my my brother went missing in Baghdad, um, and my father sent me uh, like all of these messages about him going around more morgues in Baghdad, looking between dead bodies to identify my brother. So it, 
it is it is a painful moment It's a, it's a human moment, you know, like like to see that, like like those parents grieving for a child, and like I'm, I'm just saying, like like sometimes we talk about these, what what appears to be like a, like a cliche, like we're all humans, you know, but like yeah. Going through some of these extremely ex painful experiences, the point that I want to say is that, um, as someone who went through the Iraq War as a civilian, as an Iraqi, I find it way easier to um, explain what I went through when I speak to a U.S. vet <laughs> than to someone who wasn't there. Uh, and I know that technically we were not on the same side of what was going on, but in a way we were. Uh, just like witnessing that level of violence uh, and and the, the atrocities that come come through. Um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I just I do want I do want to appreciate where, where Josh is at and and like when I was speaking about the painful rhetoric at the time, um, like I was speaking about like the larger machine, of course, or, or like the, um, telling Iraqis what. The, uh, what they should think of the bombs falling in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, like I think, like honestly, like there is much more clarity now that we can talk about these things and make. It, you know, it's, some of it is still painful, as you can tell, uh, but some of it is really a part of what what made us who we are today. There, there's kind of a cycle in war. Um, there's a reason they send children to fight because they're so full of belief and so naive. And then old men get wise and say never again. But by the time they're saying never again, the next generation is already off to the next war. When the Vietnam vets were saying we were lied to never again, the next generation of kids were already gone. And it, it's, it's systematic. It's systemic in the U.S. It's indoctrination that begins in school. It's, it begins with the indoctrination that they teach in our civics classes and our history classes. I see it. My kids that go to school, they, their civics class is writing the troops letters to say thank you. That's not education, that's indoctrination. We have a system that, that, that grows just like a harvest, children from the ground up to serve in these missions, to go do it. And then if they come back, if they're lucky enough to come back, a generation later, they say, what did I do? And, and then the cycles are already gone on. It's past me now. It's on to some other kids, you know, signing up to be the good guys in these terrible, terrible wars. Thank you, Rod, for sharing such a personal um, perspective with all of us and everyone watching. Um, Jahan, I want to give you a minute to respond to what Rod and Josh have been saying. I know we lost you for a minute there, but if there's anything you'd like to add uh, to what we've been saying, please do. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I um, feel like I'm back in that time with a very bad internet connection. Um, but uh, I, think that's, um, I think that's exactly right. Um, and thank you, Rod, for, for sharing that. And, and Josh, you, you when you bring up Vietnam, um, I remember when we were first screening the film, the people that were the most upset in the U.S. watching it were people who had were of that age, um, who had been marching against Vietnam, um, or who were vet veterans of Vietnam, who were looking at this and saying, "I cannot believe that we are doing this again." Um, and Yes, you know, you know, conceptually we know that history repeats itself, but I think it was extremely painful for Americans who had um, been through the Vietnam War to watch this film because they saw they saw it happening all over again. Um, and you know, I really felt like um, what I was saying before I got cut off about Josh was that I I did feel like there was a Yes, 
he was in a role where he was, you know, he believed what he was saying initially, but he also had a certain level of open-mindedness that you could see, which is what was interesting in terms of following him as a person because he was actually curious, um, you know, about the people that he was speaking with, about the other journalists that he was speaking with. And when we first showed the film, most people had that opinion about what was happening as Josh's opinion. They, that, that's where Americans were at. And so Josh describes people laughing at what he was saying in May, but people weren't laughing at what he was saying you know, in January. Um, that changed, right? And it was just very interesting to watch that change of how and people realizing how completely wrong our government was. Um, and it was that sort of, you know, anger at the, at, at, at our government um, that drove me there because I felt like it was such a betrayal to our people to use such fear tactics, um, you know, with weapons of mass destruction and duct tape your doors. And I mean, that, that was the messaging that was happening when I got on a plane to go to Qatar, was what was, people were really afraid of Saddam Hussein and what was going to happen. And people were afraid because September 11th had just happened. Um, so, um, I, 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 I love hearing, you know, from both of your perspectives because it's really, you know, it, it, it it really takes you to the to the core of um, you know you, you guys who are on the ground really feeling and experiencing it. Jahan, I love how when you describe why you went to Doha, that that's where news was being created. The word "created" couldn't be more accurate. News wasn't happening in Doha. It was being created on a stage it was being manipulated and what i didn't know at the time was i wasn't serving like i thought i was i was chosen because I, I i was good at my job and they trusted me to do an important job i was cast i was cast in a, in a, in a role because i sounded a certain way i looked a certain way i had a kid and family back home i was cast to sell a war and and yeah, I think I just when you said that it stuck with me about news being created there. It it certainly was, and and I mean that in the most artificial way possible. And in terms of now, it's it's a little bit like we are, um, you know, control room on steroids. What was ha what's happening with our, um, you know, with our internet, with our news feeds, right, and our little, you know, internet, uh, our. our what was happening with Facebook when Trump's election and, um, you know, where at that point in time, we were unable to have a conversation with somebody that lived half across way across the world. But with where we're at now, you, you would, you would hope that more access to information would have given us, um, you know, this ability and it, it has given us ability to see all these different points of view, but, Unfortunately, um, you know, we are very much in our own little media, silo, in our silos and our, um, you know, looking for news that confirms our bias. And um, so I, 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 you know, this is why we made a film called The Great Hack, which was about, um, you know, about, about um, you know, Facebook and data and manipulation of data leading up to the election, the U.S. election. And so, you know, 20 years on, it was really, it's been kind of depressing to see, you know, to see that. Plato wrote about it and uh, it was in Republic. So I, I studied classics at the university and in, in Plato's Republic, there's a, a scene where, um, uh sophocles no it's not sophocles it's uh oh, why am i blanking on the name that plato that, that we don't even know if he actually existed anyway the analogy is about a cave and if you, if you haven't looked up plato's cave i'm not going to labor everyone with the details of it now look it up it's kind of foundational in western philosophy 
But the point of it, it's about people who have lived their whole life in a cave, they're chained to a rock, they're seeing shadow puppets on the wall, essentially. One of them gets unchained, he's forced to go out of the cave, he's blinded by the light, but eventually realizes the beauty of the natural world. And he goes back in to tell the people who think that this stuff is reality that, that, that it's not. And um, they actually threat to kill him because they see him blinded. They think it's because of his journey. They inferred that the journey is dangerous and a risk and that that risk is to them. And I, I see that all the time now. People tied to the rock in the cave looking at these shadow puppets that they think is reality. And it, it, it truly isn't. But they Josh, will kill the messenger if you tell them. Josh, tell us more about this. I'm, I'm really interested in learning about your experiences going back to Iraq, your experiences working with young folks, um, and your, just the way you've taught people since your personal development about what it's like to open up their eyes and be open-minded. Um, tell us more about your work on, in that regard. So for those who don't know, uh, after the film came out, I resigned from the Marine Corps. Um, I resigned my commission after 14 years. And uh, that's actually, there are two different types of commission. It, I had what's called a regular commission. It means I was commissioned for life. And it's actually a legal process. It's not just getting out. I, I, I had to get a lawyer. I, I, he wrote up a letter and they, they took away my lifetime commission um, because I wanted to be completely separated. The thing about leaving at 14 years though, is you leave with nothing, um, no health care, no uh, retirement, nothing, right? And, but I felt like when I came back from the war, I knew uh, that selling the war had been disingenuous. And I also knew that the US was not only lying about Iraq, but that the way it misunderstood, or is lying about Al Jazeera, that the way it misunderstood Al Jazeera could be strategically more important than any uh, battle that was happening at that time on the ground in Iraq. Because what I knew about Al Jazeera was that everyone, everyone in the region was watching it at that time. Um, and so the battle for ideas that was happening on Al Jazeera would be more influential than perhaps any battle that was happening on any given day uh, in, in Iraq. And the U.S. seemed to not only get Al Jazeera wrong, and, and the, you can question that they did it through ignorance or intentionally, and I think it's a mix of both, um, but it seemed dangerous to me. When the film came out and um, the Marines said that I, I couldn't talk about it, uh, the story of my part in the, the film that was covered in the entertainment section landed on the front page of some papers to include at the time I was stationed in Los Angeles. And it was the front page above the fold on the LA Times, Marine lands in film and collides with superiors. And um, I had a conversation with my wife, Paige, about, I. at that time, no soldiers were getting out and saying that the war was wrong. It just, we weren't there yet. But I felt like if there was any sense of civic duty or responsibility uh, to why I joined the Marines or why I was a Marine, that at this moment, I could do far more good out of uniform than in. And so that's why I, I quit. And I went out into the media to talk about these two things, the way the world was sold and why that's so dangerous, and the U.S.'s misunderstanding about Jazeera. And just to give you a moment of how, I think at that point I, I had the moral compass pointed in the right direction, but I still didn't know what I was doing. Um, the first call came from Koppel, Joe asking me to be on Nightline. And uh, is that sound on my end? Am I doing something that's creating a sound? Do you guys hear a sound? Yeah, I think um, if you could meet yourself, that would be great. So there you go. Oh. So, Koppel Show calls and says, we want to have you on Nightline. Ted wants to do the whole show on you and this film and the Rock War. Um, and I was like, yeah, okay, great. Absolutely, I'll be there. They were going to fly me to Washington, D.C. I hung up and I looked at my closet and I saw nothing but uniforms. I didn't own a um, a suit and I didn't and I just at that moment realized I can no longer wear those that had defined me for so long. That was my identity hanging in the closet that I no longer had access to. And um, it just works metaphorically for me trying to figure out kind of where I was. So I ended up going uh, on a lot of the media talking about these issues. And eventually, about six months later, I got a call from a guy at the BBC who said they'd been there 28 years and he was leaving. 
And uh, he saw he saw the movie in London, thought I was interesting. Uh, next thing you know, by January of 05, we're meeting in DC and uh, agreed on a handshake that I was going to help launch Al Jazeera English. By May, the contract was signed, and uh, I, I got this chance to like uh, just do this kind of incredible thing, uh, be a part of this team. And so we launched this channel. By Odin, I did some specials on war, on the AK-47, on I did a lot of war reporting. But by the beginning of the Obama administration, I start Fault Lines. And it's this half-hour investigative show about America uh, where we go after systemic injustice in every episode. Um, and we've done really well. Um, it's a great, a great team that has become one of the um, – uh, considered one of the, the the premier shows on Al Jazeera English, and I'm really really proud of the work that I've done there. Um, but like in getting a chance, you ask about a chance to teach. University of Texas reached out to me to offer me this kind of uh, long term position as a lecturer here, uh, which I'm really thankful for. But one of the things I did for a number of years was to go to universities kind of all over the country that show a control room, and then I would talk about war in media afterward and so i did get a chance to reach a lot of audiences kind of one-on-one -on -one that way eventually i wrote a book um called mission out to zero the point was that if it, in this country right 330 million people over half of them don't own a passport uh those who do own them uh over half of those don't use it and so you have a country that, that doesn't travel outside of itself very much and then whenever I travel across America and I speak, I, I clearly can see the audience thinks that they're in the media capital of the world. But the truth is, this is one of the few places where I'll go at night and I won't be able to see BBC World, Al Jazeera English, uh, CNN International. The US exists on a, a media island and there's this perspective that they live on planet America. The whole world is, is America with a, a bunch of people around the edges who are trying to get into it. And that's that's really life on this planet. And that's the perspective here. And so it occurred to me, if, if they're not going to have passports, if they're not going to use them, and if they're media, like the, the, the news I will get when I go to my hotel room that night will be solely domestic, often on one story, all three channels, one story, uh, and as sensationalist as, as possible. And probably not the most important thing happening that day in the world, much less even this country. And so how can we, and if I take the central lesson of control room, that we have to spend time with other people to realize we have more in common than indifference. How can you do that in America if you don't have a passport? If you have a passport, you're not traveling. And if all the media and the news you see reinforces your view of planet America, how can you expect Americans to, to, to include people around the world in their limits of empathy? And so my idea was an international channel. If we could get them access to international news, they could see that the world doesn't necessarily look like them and maybe come to appreciate how big and diverse the world is. So that was the idea behind Mission Al Jazeera and trying to promote that idea. Eventually, we did open Al Jazeera America. It was a terrible idea. We closed it after three years. And I mean, I, I can talk about that uh, as well. It was, it was just such a disaster. But um my entire mission has been since I got out of the Marine Corps is I shouldn't say that actually it's changed. I was a Marine for 14 years. It started when I was 17. I've been with Al Jazeera 17 years. Um, I'm far more of a journalist now than a, than a spokesperson. That transition took a while. I don't necessarily have that mission anymore. I get excited talking about, it, but that's not my thing anymore. Like now, I, I want to tell stories that matter. I want to give a voice to, I think, a lot of people in America who don't have a voice uh, in the media as it, as, it, as it is, or they're not given a voice by the media as it is, or they're outside of the conversations. And so we, we do a lot on immigration, on criminal justice, on marginalized societies. Um, and I'm a journalist through and through now. And, and so it's no longer my mission to try to fix America. It just isn't. It's, 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 it's my job to tell stories and to get as close to the truth about what's happening right now as possible. Thank you, Josh. And I would like to echo, uh, well, I would like to praise Fault Lines for its incredible investigative journalism. It's a wonderful series. You can watch it on YouTube. Um, I highly recommend all the viewers of this panel uh, to take some time to check it out. And also there's a great book about Al Jazeera America by um, Will Yeomans. The book is called An Unlikely Audience. So I also recommend you check that out if, if you've got a chance. 
Uh, we do have one question from the audience uh, for Rod. And that question is, what are your, what's your view and what's your analysis of the kind of sectarian quota system that the US government set up in Iraq uh, during in, during the war? And, and what does that look like today on the ground in Iraq for Iraqi society? It's a, it's a good question. I, I started my remarks saying that uh, the Iraq war did not start in 2003. Uh, I talked about how um, Iraqis, witnessed and lived through um, bombardment and sanctions since 1991. Uh, and this question is a good uh, reason for me to say that the Iraq war has not ended in 2003. It's still going on until now. Uh, the violence and um, the devastation that the Iraqi society is, is going through to date can be traced back to the, the 2003 invasion. Uh, one of the most devastating um, uh, results of the invasion was the, the introduction of this new system in Iraq, um, a, a sectarian uh, system uh, that built the government based on quotas, uh, so Sunnis have some positions and Shia have some positions and Kurds have some positions and other minorities have some other positions. It's an awful system. It's, uh, I mean, looking at what's happening in Iraq and in, in, in Lebanon this week, um, is, uh, these are two reasons for why this is an awful system. Uh, so like we saw how in, in Lebanon, um, a country that is also divided along sectarian lines with a dysfunctional, corrupt, uh, sectarian government. Uh, there, there were clashes in the streets that killed uh, and injured dozens this week along the same sectarian lines of the civil war. And Iraq had uh, another round of elections this week. Uh, uh, another round of election that uh, had the least number of Iraqis vote since the 2003 invasion. Uh, the government is one of the top three most corrupt governments in the world. Um, Iraq is a rich country, but uh, uh, the corruption and sectarianism has uh, moved it from being one of the most developed countries in the in the region when it came to basic services and education and healthcare uh, to one of the least developed in the world um, so the sectarian system is awful it's it's a disaster and uh, it's a disaster for for any country to um, to have these deep divisions uh, and uh, create the sense of tribalism uh, and sectarianism rather than uh, encourage uh, the uh, like belonging to a country based on civic, uh, you know, identity uh, for 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 Iraqis to view themselves as Iraqis rather than to view themselves as Sunnis and Shia. And that I want to say two points. And I am keeping an eye on, on time. I know that we are uh, a few minutes, um, you know, uh, after uh, after four already. Um, but but the, the two things that I want to mention is. Um, for for many Iraqis, this um, uh, idea to divide the country based on sectarian uh, backgrounds did not make any sense because um, Iraqis historically were very very overlapped. Um, people like me, you know, I'm, I'm half Sunni and half Shia, uh, are not an exception to how the country used to be. Uh, Sunnis and Shia in Iraq. Um, lived in the same neighborhoods, uh, in, like in big cities. Um, most of the big tribes had Sunni and Shia branches. It wasn't like, there was no like um, strict divisions. Um, and actually, I remember something yesterday when I was watching the, the movie, um, because the, the deck of cards, the 55 uh, top Iraqi leaders came up. And, and the fun fact about that, is um, is that 
the, the narrative that the U.S. introduced in 2002-2003 was that uh, the former Iraqi government was uh, a Sunni dictatorship and the Shia were an oppressed majority. Um, and the, the former Iraqi dictatorship was awful and brutal, uh, but it was very secular. And it's not true that it was um, uh, skewed in, in, in a sectarian way. And one of the like interesting facts uh, attached to that, it, it has to do with the, with the 55 deck of cards, um, because out of the 55, 36 were Shia. Uh, and uh, I've always gave this uh, interesting statistic, because not to say that the former, the Saddam Hussein government was an inclusive, uh, you know, non-sectarian uh, democracy, but to say that it was a, a hyper-secular, anti-religious uh, dictatorship, uh, that it wasn't really running with uh, like a, a Sunni agenda in the country at all. That wasn't like, that wasn't the tool that it used. It was a very secular dictatorship, very hyper-nationalist dictatorship, it was an Arab nationalist dictatorship that did discriminate against uh, Iraqi Kurds um, in, in like some, some of the laws. Uh, but there was the sectarian divisions were not as portrayed uh, in the media. And like I always tell stories about like my, my like the Shia part side of my family who um, like viewed themselves as Iraqi first uh, before 2003. And I think that shifted, and like the the public understanding of identity has shifted a lot since. And now the divisions are very very deep. Like Josh was saying, you know, that when the new generation comes, the older generations, like whatever ideologies and and uh, conclusions, uh, don't necessarily transfer, uh, you know, to, to the new one. Um, the new generation uh, generations in Iraq are more sectarian than it used to be back in the day. There is still a big pushback against sectarianism. There is still statistically a majority of Iraqis who uh, oppose dividing the country up upon sectarian lines. Um, and we saw that in the uprisings that happened in Baghdad and other cities in the south uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the Iraqi government uh, you know, injured and killed hundreds of, of young Iraqis who primarily went to the streets to say no to sectarianism and no to foreign intervention. They said no to, no to foreign intervention, whether it comes from Iran or from the US. So mostly, um, you know, Shia and Sunni uh, Iraqis who live in uh, center and south of the country. So it's, there is still that, that like tradition of anti-sectarianism uh, lives in Iraq. But I would say like the, like one of the most, most devastating um, uh, uh, like ideas that were introduced, one of the most devastating legacies of the U.S. Uh, led intervention was the creation of this, uh, like the Paul Bremer uh, creation of a governing council that told Iraqis, "You will be a prime minister because you're Sunni, and you are you'll be a or like a prime minister because you're Shia. You'll be a head of the parliament because you're Sunni. You'll be the president because of uh, you're Kurdish and." And that was that is unprecedented. It did not happen before in Iraq, and many Iraqis want, don't want to want to see it happen again in the future. So the, the main point that I'm making here is that whether it's sectarianism, whether it's corruption, whether it's the you know intervention of uh, of Iran and um, Israel and the U.S. and Turkey and many many countries are interfering in Iraq in unprecedented ways. All of these are legacies of the U.S. intervention. Uh, Iraqis still suffer and die because of the consequences of that destruction that happened um, uh, of their um, country but, uh, like in the, throughout the 90s and 2003. And for us, and now, you know, like the, the same way that Josh was talking about like personal responsibility, I am a U.S. American now and I have, like I'm, as a U.S. citizen who has been paying taxes for the last 16 years and contributing <laughs> to our wars. Uh, like I, I do have that sense of, of individual responsibility to also say that we have to, as a country, we, the United States, have to um, 
fix our mistakes in Iraq. Uh, number one, we have to stop making more mistakes. The U.S. has to completely withdraw from Iraq and stop supporting whatever political corrupt political parties it has partnered with in the last uh, 20 years or so. But more importantly, we have to fix what we broke. We have to pay for what we broke. And, uh, you know, the example that, that is out there uh, for uh, accountability and, and uh, responsibility after an invasion is, ironically, Iraq itself. Iraq invaded and occupied Kuwait in 1990. And the United Nations created a special commission, UNCC, uh, the UN, United Nations uh, Compensation uh, Commission, uh, that has calculated the damages uh, that Iraq has caused to Kuwait. And Iraq still pays to date compensation to Kuwait for the invasion and the destruction that happened there. Um, I would say that, you know, for for us as U.S. Americans, um, I, I, I always will con will continue to advocate for us compensating Iraqis and Afghans and other countries that were uh, affected by U.S. foreign policy by calculating the damages of their human casualties for the actual uh, losses uh, of destruction in their, in their countries and having the, the United States be responsible for compensating these other countries that we destroyed. It's, it's not just um, you know, enough to, to, for us to, um, to look back and, and, and like say, you know, this was a mistake or sh we should not have done that. Uh, I think it's important to have a system of accountability to uh, call for compensation. The U.S. has to pay an actual price to fix what uh, has done, was done in those countries. Thank you, Ra'ed. And um, I'm, I'm hoping maybe in your concluding remarks, you can tell us more about efforts by groups today that are working for justice and accountability uh, in Iraq. Uh, I want to take a question from the audience now for Josh. And then after that, we'll give each of, I'll give each of you a chance to say your concluding remarks. So I know we are coming up on uh, half past the hour. Uh, Josh, the question from the audience for you is um, even though you're no longer with the military, are there some things you can't express because of the military? For example, did they give you rules about what you can and cannot say regarding your time at CENTCOM? I can save us a, a lot of time and just say no. I can say whatever I want. Uh, they didn't give me any rules. They've never tried to stop me from really saying anything I want. Okay, well, thank you, Josh. Uh, Jahan, I'd like to pass it over to you for any concluding remarks you have, any thoughts you have on the conversation we've had today, which has been incredibly powerful. It went by very quickly, <laughs> um, and I uh, would just love to hear what you have to say. Jahan, you're, you're muted. Josh, what was the answer to the question? I, it's crackling for me, so I'm I'm struggling to hear what was it was. No, there there are no limits to anything that, that, that I can say. The the military has never tried to give me any kind of rules or or boundaries of what I can say or not say. Jihan, would you like to give some concluding remarks? Um, I'm not sure. It's hear. been I haven't watched control. I think we're losing her. It's another cliffhanger. Um, in so many, uh, this is really bad. bad. My head is bad. Can you hear me? Yeah, Jihan, why don't we let Josh go and me? then you can uh, recalibrate over there. And we'll come back to you in a minute. No. Josh, why don't you go ahead with your final remarks? Sure. Um... I mean, first, I'd like to say thank you to Jahan for capturing what she did um, and for making it as significant as it as it was. Uh, that that took a lot of work, a lot of effort, and I think it it sits in the historical record now in a way that that is important and that we'll look back on. Um, the thing that 
that that kills me though is I have no doubt it's just going to happen again. I have no doubt that it's going to happen again, and I wish I knew how to change or or stop that. Um, but I I think that just historically speaking, that that when we have these gyms like Control Room that are at once intimate and and macroscopic and and what they're the story they're telling um it i i mean i i have to say like it's funny when she described me as a character because now i do what she does she that she she makes full length films but we we make you know little 30 minute films I, I i totally get it but what i see what i'm passionate about now is <clears throat> is the power of storytelling religion is is storytelling um the, the narratives that we tell ourselves, the narratives that our countries, our societies tell themselves, it, it's so important. And I, I know that when I watch a film like Control Room and the lessons that I take away from it and how timeless they feel, um, it, it, it reminds me of how important storytelling and storytellers like Shahan are to, to us, and, and not just Americans, but to us as humans. Thank you, Josh. Jahan, are you? Can you Thank, hear you. Us? Thank you, Josh. I can. Can you hear me okay? I decided somebody suggested to turn off the camera, which is a good idea. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great, great. Um, well, thank you, Josh. And I was saw Control Room for the first time in a long time, um, right before September 11th. They, sh they screened it downtown um, as a, there were, you know, it was the 20 year anniversary. And so there were, there were a lot of, um, uh, uh, events that were commemorating the loss of life on September 11th, and there was a group of filmmakers and artists that extended that um, to the loss of life that occurred in Afghanistan and in uh, and in Iraq. And so, Control Room was a part of that. Um, and uh, what I thought as I was watching it was really, um, you know, going on, uh, continuing on Josh's point is, yeah, it, it's. It, I'm, I, I still continue to be passionate about storytelling um, because, but it, it's because of the people, you know, that we are able to find film that are lights in this world, you know, and, and um, you know, Josh may not see it in himself, but, but I did see somebody that was interested in having a conversation, which I think was very difficult for somebody in his position at that time. Um, and even just having that, desire to have a conversation, being open um, to somebody filming him, talking with people who had very different points of view than his, I felt was somebody that was was somewhat of a risk taker. Um, and I'd say the same thing for, for Hassan um, and Samir, the other characters in, in the film, um, and to the people that I followed in, in films since then. Um, and you know, this talk actually occurs at a very um, um, difficult time because um, there are two people that really supported this film getting out there in a big way that have recently passed. And one person was yesterday, Diane Weirman, who um, actually was the person that let Control Room um, air at Sundance. And she saw a really terrible rough cut of the film. Um, about, you know, I don't know, four months before Sundance. And she said, you know, the idea of this being in our festival, you know, and Sundance is a festival which really provides a platform to a film to get out there in a major way. But the cut was awful. And she saw it and she saw something in it. And she said, you know, we really need this. We really need to have this discussion um, this year. And it's urgent. And she took a huge risk on it. Um, She's a real, uh, um, an incredible woman and filmmaker, and she 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 passed away um, yesterday um, at the age of 66. Um, so, I'm uh, of lung cancer, and I'm just I'm I'm thinking about I'm thinking about her today. Um, thinking about my dad who gave me the first, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, twenty thousand dollars to just sort of like get on a plane and go and 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 film. Um, he uh, he passed away about a week and a half, two two weeks ago now. Um, and so 
this is actually a very sort of special moment um, that I'm actually able to see Josh again and to really talk about this moment because for me, you know, it was it was really um, about getting on a plane and trying to understand something that I didn't understand. I didn't understand who was manipulating the news that way and why people were not seeing the truth. And it was a bit crazy and it was a bit naive, but I was in my 20s and it just seemed like I, I couldn't do anything else but to go there. And um, now as somebody with three kids and other responsibilities, I may not be that person, but I get so excited when I see other young people and filmmakers that are ready to just kind of jump into the fire because they have big questions um, that, that they want answered. And so, um, you know, I guess I'm thinking about risk takers and people that, that believe in, in, in people when, you know, they're, they're trying to get an idea out there or get, um, you know, get people to see something in a different light um, because, you know, filmmakers like myself who had really zero funding and zero support and wanted to do this relied so much on people like Josh and Hassan as the characters willing to take a chance on me as a filmmaker and then also people like Diane Weirman who, um, who, who, who got the film into Sundance and allowed the world to see it. Thank you, Jahan, and I'm so sorry to hear about the passing of both your father and Diane, and, and thank you for sharing with us how they have influenced and contributed to and supported you on this journey, and it's an honor to, to honor them and their legacy in this event today, and so thank you so much for sharing, um, and thank you. Rod, I will leave it with you for, for the last remarks. Um, sorry for your loss, um, Jihan, and, and, and thank you for, for sharing uh, the story. Thank you for, share, for sharing all of your work. Um, and thank you, Josh, uh, as well, for this uh, uh, like a, a conversation in 2021. We've had conversations over the years. <laughs> it's, uh, I feel like we need a documentary on, on our conversations about these documentaries. Um, my, my final remarks is really reiterating something that Josh said earlier, which is um, we now know that invading Iraq was a disaster that should not have happened. We now know that invading and occupying Afghanistan is a disaster that should not have happened. Uh, but I also know that it's going to happen again. And that is the most painful um, realization that I come to over and over again. Uh, when I heard the rhetoric surrounding the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, there was absolutely no uh, recognition, no introspection on why invading another nation was morally, legally, politically wrong. Uh, there were uh, similar justifications to the withdrawal, uh, the same assumptions about Afghans being not ready for democracy. We can't teach them to, we can give them weapons, but we can't teach them how to defend their countries and have courage to defend, defend themselves. Rhetoric that is very, very similar to the rhetoric that was used to, to justify the invasion. And the same in Iraq. Uh, the withdrawal from Iraq was accompanied with um, US mainstream messaging about how Iraqis are primitive and they're stuck in sectarian wars that started thousands of years ago. They're not ready for democracy. Uh, they're not smart enough. They're, they're not sophisticated enough. Um, so that, 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 is, that is my unfortunate <laughs> uh, conclusion remark that, that, you know, control room gives us a, a, a snapshot of something that happened 
um, 18 years ago. Um, and it is, it is an amazing opportunity to look back and, and see the devastation, the, the harm, the, the crimes that were committed, um, whether it is children being killed, whether it's civilians being displaced, whether it is Tariq Ayyub being killed on, on, on the roof of, of the Al Jazeera building, um, it is important. Uh, I think it is even more important um, to have uh, an introspective political analysis about the United States' role in the world and whether or not the U.S. should uh, or could or you know, even should consider invading and interfering in other countries, the way that we view other people, uh, the way that we as U.S. Americans understand and evaluate other people's capacity, their agency, their willingness to improve themselves, the assumptions about um, Muslims uh, in general, or the way that Muslims uh, treat each other's, uh, treat, uh, you know, Muslim men treat Muslim women, uh, the LGBT communities in the Muslim, Muslim world. Withdrawal from Afghanistan was accompanied with the same rhetoric that justified going to Afghanistan, the same Islamophobic, white supremacist rhetoric that justified the war. So, so I'm hoping that, you know, like watching the control room and other similar uh, movies and documentaries will create a space for us here in the US to say, there is something bigger that we have to change. It's not just about how many troops we have in Iraq and how long they stay. It's not just about how many troops in Afghanistan and how long they stay. It's about whether or not we should be interfering uh, in other countries, whether or not we should be supporting abusive and apartheid regimes around the world, uh, whether it's Egypt or Israel or Saudi Arabia or others, it's it is it's it's a time for like having these kind of conversations. And I am hoping that this year and next year and the next uh, and in 2023, like when when we're approaching the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War, that we'll keep these very important questions alive. Thank you, Ra'ed. Thank you, Jahan. Thank you, Josh. For anyone who did not see the screening of the film right before this panel conversation, it will be showing again Thursday, October 21st at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I am so grateful to all of you for sharing your expertise, your experience. Um, this has been an extremely moving and deep conversation. Uh, and while it's true that this cycle may continue, I feel confident that we're all going to fight like hell to stop it. So thank you for sharing this space with us. Um, thank you to uh, Lina Alarian and everyone at the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. Uh, and I encourage all of our viewers to watch the rest of the War on Terror Film Festival series at this extremely important time. Thank you again. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, everyone.